Thank you. Um, so first of all, I'm going to try and get through this presentation without having a coughing fit. I'm sucking on my lozenge at the minute, so I'm going to try and avoid it. Sorry to everyone who's done talks and you've had that person in the back coughing. It was me. Um, okay, so yeah, I want to talk about SeaWorld and how SeaWorld relates to zoos and how people feel about SeaWorld and ask the question, why are we not why has SeaWorld become this pariah in you know, the public eye, animal rights activist eyes, and yet that hasn't necessarily followed over into the zoo industry? So my background, um, I've been an anti-captivity campaigner, quite specifically an anti-captivity campaigner for about eight years, um, having been the director of the Captive Animals Protection Society for about five years, and I still work in consultancy with the Born Free Foundation. So a lot of my work is focused on wild animals in captivity, whether that be in zoos, circuses, the exotic pet trade. I was still... <clears throat> I was still working for CAPS when Blackfish... Can I, has everybody here heard of Blackfish? Can you stick your hand up if you haven't heard of Blackfish? Ah, that was a trick question. <laughs> if you haven't heard of it, OK. I'll talk a little bit about Blackfish for anyone who hasn't um, seen it. But when that film came out in 2013 or early 2014, um, I was working for CAPS. We were in the office and we were like, this is it. This is the tipping point where people are going to start talking about zoos. It's going to start to get into the public consciousness and it's going to become an issue that people start to really question. Didn't really happen that way, though, which I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about. And... I did this in this morning. I was talking to um, one, of my, one of my friends, fellow activist Mark, last night, and he said, yeah. He said, you know, zoos have always been kind of the Cinderella of the AR movement. Kind of sits on the periphery. Nobody really wants to go there. Some, some organisations do. But as a general rule, they've generally been left largely alone if you compare it to other industries, so the farming industry, the river section industry, the circus industry. So... So yeah, um, my question really is, if, we, if we've come to the point where we hate SeaWorld so much, why are we not putting that same heat on the zoo industry? So I think there's a couple of reasons, and you know, I've had this discussion actually while I've been here um, with a couple of activists sort of talking about, okay, why, why focus on zoos or why not focus on zoos? I think one of the most obvious responses to why perhaps zoos shouldn't necessarily be our focus is when we look at the sheer scale of suffering that goes on in other industries, particularly the agriculture industry, the levels of torture that are inflicted on animals in the vivisection industry, then zoos do suddenly seem quite like quite benign um, institutions. You know, they're not, well, not necessarily beating, torturing animals, killing animals. Um, and doing all those things on such a scale. I think the other thing um, is that also, I think people are quite confused about zoos. I think that this, this sort of narrative that zoos are good for animals, that they're saving them from poachers or hunters, if they lived in the wild, they wouldn't be safe. Zoos somehow contribute to conservation, which is something I'm not going to get into in this talk, but... Um, it's something which I think even animal activists, I've given talks about zoos at numerous um, events and vegan fairs and things like that, and people do still come up to me afterwards and sort of say, yeah, but you know, my, my little niece or my nephew or my, my son or my daughter, how would they get to see animals if they didn't go to the zoo? And that always, it concerns me that those questions come from within the AR movement as well. Um, so my argument as to why, why zoos are important, why zoos should be on our agenda, Okay, there's a number of things. First of all, I think people who argue that it's okay to eat animals or it's okay to test on animals do so either ignorantly or knowingly, whether or not they, they know it's untrue or not. It comes from a point, you know, what feeding ourselves is fundamental. If people believe they have to feed themselves with animals, that's something really, really fundamental to a person. Um, so you're talking, people are talking about, well, I, I eat animals for sustenance, I eat animals to survive. We don't need it. Everyone in this room knows we don't need it. But I can see how that could sit very firmly with someone. When we talk about vivisection, again, those who believe that vivisection actually does any good for medical advancement, you can see why people hold on to that, onto that quite strongly, that if they genuinely believe that tested on animals was going to find a cure for cancer or X, Y, and Z, then you can see those are pretty firm reasons to support something, even though it's cruel and even though we would never agree with it. I think one of the reasons that I think we need to be thinking about zoos is the reasons for going to a zoo are just so frivolous. 
and so pointless. It's, you know, I've, I've got two hours on a Saturday afternoon and I'm bored, so I'm going to go and watch this animal. And this animal will be in there. If you're talking about an elephant, this, this elephant will be in that zoo for 70 years in the same space. Um, so I think for me, if we can't convince people to stop using animals for such utterly frivolous reasons, then how are we ever going to convince them to stop using them to feed ourselves or to further medical science? So that's one reason that I think it's really important that we do need to be thinking about zoos. And in addition, it's not a small industry. Um, the American Zoo Association released figures which are probably very conservative, which suggest there are about 10,000 zoos in the world. Um, and research that my organisation at the time, CAPS, did um, a couple of years back in 2011 showed that on average there's about 700 animals in each zoo. So you're talking about just on the ones that the AZA sort of recognises zoos, you're talking about 7 million animals. So it's not, we're not talking small numbers. So I think the other thing which is important to think about with zoos is also the knock-on effect that they have. So you've got the knock-on effect to the exotic pet trade. Not, and there's, there's the kind of link that, you know, a child goes to a zoo, sees a meerkat, says, I want a meerkat for a pet. You go out and buy a meerkat as a pet, and then you're fueling this, this both the legal and the illegal wildlife trade, which is absolutely devastating in terms of to the individuals and also to the environment and to the, on a species level, on a conservation level. So, and then finally, I think we really need to be challenging zoos as an institution in the wider usually very white, very Western uh, conservation movement, and I say conservation with um, some cynicism, because zoos perpetuate colonialism, they perpetuate xenophobia, they, they thrive on, off the back of their rescuing these animals from those people over there in the range state, usually people of colour, indigenous people, um, and people who necessarily for zoos to exist and for this kind of white western conservation narrative to continue need to be demonized need to be shown as the savages or the barbarians or the poachers or the people who don't know how to look after animals or the environment so that's a, in a nutshell why i think zoos need to be on the agenda so now i just want to have a look at how that yeah basically the blackfish effect and what happened when this documentary came out so a few people didn't know, hadn't heard of Blackfish. The Blackfish was a documentary which was released in late 2013. Um, it charted the story of Tilikum, the um, orca who sadly died um, last year, I think it was late last year, um, and his life as a, a Sea World star. So he was used to perform. He died very, very prematurely. Um, he was used to father numerous other um, orcas within the sea world sort of family the sea world brand and it also it charted both his life and also the very premature death of one of his trainers um, and I never know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly Dawn Bronchot I think her name is um, her first name is certainly Dawn and she was killed during um, during a show she was dragged underwater and she was effectively drowned what was really interesting, the, the, the documentary was based on the book Death at SeaWorld, which I'd recommend if anyone hasn't seen the documentary or read the book, do both. Um, the book adds an awful lot more context and information to it. It's a fantastic read. What was really interesting in the way that this story was told was, I mean, it could have been, it could have been um, sort of characterised as, you know, a horror story. It really was. Dawn Branchow's death was horrific. There were other deaths at SeaWorld which were... Um, attributed to Tilikum as well. And it could have been a horror story which demonised uh, Tilikum, but the way in which this documentary was made, I mean, it was pretty low budget, it was like $76,000 to make it. It focused so much on both stories, on the loss of the loss of Dawn, but also the absolute tragedy of this young orca who had spent his life in a swimming pool and was developing really, really serious mental health issues, uh, physical health issues, which led him to just all sorts of abnormal behaviours. And Tilikum became kind of the tragic victim in this documentary. And what happened next was incredible. So the Empty the Tanks movement, has everyone heard of the Empty the Tanks movement? Can you stick your hand up if you have? Okay, cool. So lots of people have heard of it. So the Empty the Tanks movement started and it just went, it went global. 
and everyone knew about it. I mean, having worked on zoo, zoo issues for years, I live in the UK, so you'd be like, oh, I work on zoos. And they're like, oh, yeah, but Chester Zoo's nice, isn't it? <sighs> but when you say SeaWorld now, you know, even, you know, someone on the street knows that, oh, SeaWorld's terrible. Everybody hates SeaWorld. And, and in part, it was because this movement just spread all around the world in all the major cities. I think every year, still in May, the Empty the Tanks march happens. And this was all against uh, this one company. And this is what happened to SeaWorld's share price. As a direct result of this low-budget documentary, you can imagine how as anti-captivity campaigners, we were like, yes, this is the beginning of the end for the zoo industry. And I think the, um, the share price actually halved over the, over the period of time from when it was released to now. And you probably may, if you followed the story, you'll know that SeaWorld has done all kinds of attempts at damage limitation, which are um, comical, they're so tragic, but um, it hasn't worked for them. So the current situation with SeaWorld is this. So in early 2016, they were forced to pledge to stop breeding their orca. Um, they're continuing to refuse to move them out of the parks and into sea pens, but people continue putting pressure on them, so perhaps that will happen. Um, later in the same year, California actually banned captive orca breeding, so that's shut the door on that completely. They also banned the use of, the use of orca for entertainment, um, but that's a very grey area because we have elephant shows and zoos all over the world and that, that's technically educational. So it remains to be seen what actually happens and what those, um, what those orca shows that will continue in some form look like. But the principle is good, the fact that people are now rejecting the use of animals in this way. Um, so yeah, the share price sank to record lows um, and the company reported almost half a million fewer visitors during the second quarter of 2016. So that's half a million fewer visitors just in a three-month period. Um, yeah, the share price dropped by more than 50%. And Tilikum, um, the orca at the centre of the blackfish story, passed away at about at least half his natural age at just 25 years old. But his legacy is quite incredible. So... I was, um, about a year after this was released, I was reading, um, so I don't know if you some of you will be familiar with the, with the blog um, sort of site, The Dodo, writes a lot about animal issues and um, obviously now everything is written in this kind of like BuzzFeed style where it's like seven reasons to do this or five reasons to do that. Um, and I read, this, I read this blog post which was seven reasons why you and everyone you should know should boycott SeaWorld. I was like, hang on a minute, I found this cliff art which looked like me, I just wanted to put it in my presentation. Um, so these seven reasons, I was looking at them and I'm like, these are, these are not just reasons to boycott one organisation. So SeaWorld has violated the Animal Welfare Act. I'm like, yep, that sounds familiar. SeaWorld separates orca calves from their mothers and then claims that it doesn't. Yep. SeaWorld runs an orca breeding programme that has little regard for cetacean health. Yep. SeaWorld stole baby penguins from their colony in Ant Antarctica, so stealing animals from their natural habitat. SeaWorld shows little regard for worker safety. Um, SeaWorld drugs their animals. That was one, there was a huge scandal about that, the fact that they were drugging the animals and giving them antidepressants. And again, those of us who've worked on captivity issues know that this happens all the time. Um, and finally, see, and this really made me, SeaWorld profits of keeping animals and other, other, other un, orca and other marine animals in captivity. It's like, yeah, that, yeah, <laughs> that's what they do. That's what zoos do. Um, so now I want to go through and just talk you through how all of these, all of these seven reasons to boycott SeaWorld are equally seven reasons to boycott the wider zoo industry. So failure to meet legal requirements. They were talking about breaking the law and breaking animal welfare ordinances and breaking the Animal Welfare Act. Again, it happens all the time. So Collins Zoo in the US had its license revoked following 22 violations of the US Animal Welfare Act a number of years ago. But that's actually quite unusual. For an organisation to actually be um, charged and convicted of animal cruelty offences, that's really, really unusual. Most of the time it happens, it's either known about or it's not known about, but even when it's known about, very little action is taken. So the European Commission took action against Spain as an entire country in 2011 because Spain just hadn't really bothered to implement the European Directive on Zoos, which was supposed to offer some form of protection. 
Research that, um, again, when I was working with CAPS, we carried out in 2011, found that 90% of zoos had failed at some point during our research um, period, which was a five-year period, had failed to meet some legal requirements. They were breaking the law at some stage. My current doctoral research is in a very similar thing, how the law equates and how the law does or doesn't protect um, animals in captivity. And between 2008 and 2014, I found 700 and, I think 769 individual recognised by an inspector instances of zoos not meeting their legal requirements and zero instances of any enforcement action being taken whatsoever. And then finally, those of you who probably only heard of this if you're in the UK, but South Lake Zoo in England recently went through this whole, it was a whole palaver involving months and months and months of council meetings and administrative meetings. Um, they had their new licence denied to them because over, was it over 400 or 500 animals had died at that zoo over a four-year period. Now, incredibly, even when 400 animals die, this was never subject to legal proceedings. This was just council meetings where the council were deciding whether or not to give them a new licence or not. They weren't charged. They weren't really even investigated. So 400 animals can die, and that still isn't enough. Um, and then, in the end, the guy, so the guy pictured at the bottom, David Gill, who was the um, former manager, basically what they did, he stepped aside, the previous senior manager moved up a step, and they granted the licence on that basis. So the same people are running the zoo, where 400 animals died, and they can just continue. So the idea of failing to meet legal requirements being, in any way, exclusive to SeaWorld simply isn't the case. Separating mothers from their young. Now... Again, this is something, breeding animals in zoos is, is one, of their, one of their conservation activities. Um, but separating animals from their parents is something that is not only common, it's also necessary in many ways because of the way that zoos keep their animals. So, first of all, there's the really cynical practices that they have. So, things like hand-rearing big cats. Um, specifically so that people can cuddle them and have photo ops with them. Now, if you have ever seen a zoo, ever seen photos of, of people cuddling little lion cubs or tiger cubs, those lion or tiger cubs will have been removed from their mum because can you imagine going into a lion or tiger's enclosure to just go and grab their, their little one while you do some photo opportunities with it? So animals are deliberately removed from their mum, again, for utterly frivolous reasons, so people can have their photograph taken with them on a day out at the zoo. And that has really long-term impact, as you can imagine. Removing young animals in the same way, removing human, human animals from their mothers or their parents or their caregivers at a young age and being raised, you know, sort of completely independently of that. These animals grow up with psychological problems. They grow up with behavioural problem, problems. They grow up, there's been... Um, research done which shows there's really high levels of aggression which then affect reproductive health um, and all sorts of ongoing issues. So the minute that you remove that big cat from his or her mum and start to use him or her for these, these kind of things and that's it, you have put that cat on a path where he was in captivity anyway but you have, you have changed that animal's life forever and you can't get that back. Um, Elephants are probably one really, really, really sad case in zoos because obviously male elephants are physically huge. Well, all elephants are. Male elephants are physically huge animals, and when they come into muths, which is kind of the, I guess, the the male equivalent of what you we would call heat for a for a female, they are incredibly dangerous to be around. Well, humans aren't supposed to be around elephants at all, so certainly not when they're in muths. And what that means is that male elephants are generally just kept completely separate. They live completely solitary lives in these barren enclosures and zoos um, because their natural behaviour makes it too dangerous for them to be with other elephants. Now, if they're in the wild, what they would do, sometimes they would live in bachelor groups, um, they would come together into their, into their family groups at the time. When they're in muths, they would go off and kind of do their own thing, go and look for their mate. But... What that, that, what that then leads to is people thinking that male elephants are actually solitary animals, which isn't true at all. And they're also moved around a lot. So because zoos, zoos need to breed animals, and if they keep breeding the same animals with the same animals, obviously then that results in inbreeding, and so they move animals around. So at any one time, there will be animals travelling across this, this continent from, and from much, much further away, um, simply to be, to be bred in zoos. 
So the idea of separating family is something which is necessary for zoos to continue. So breeding with disregard for health, this was, this was actually talking more with SeaWorld, it was talking about, um, first of all, inbreeding. So Tilikum, for example, um, fathered numerous um, numerous orca, and then those orca were interbred. So there's, there's all sorts of problems in terms of um, inbreeding. But again, this happens an awful lot in zoos, and one of the most prominent and one of the most obvious examples of this is with the um, white animals, so white lions, white tigers. Um, they're probably the most popular ones. Now, white lions and tigers are often characterized by the zoo industry. They're very careful. They always say that they're rare. They never say they're endangered because they're not a, they're not a species. They don't exist. Um, there was thought to be a kind of founder a founder pride of white lions in um, a South African natu national park years ago, but it was a genetic aberration. It wasn't, they're not a different species of lion who happen to be white. So what you have to do to, to be able to make sure that the lion cubs or the tiger cubs that you're gonna breed in your zoo definitely come out as white, you need to breed to two white parents together who already have that. It's a, it's a condition called leucism. And it is, it's a recessive gene, which then changes the colouring. And lots of zoos around the world deliberately breed these white and white um, lions and tigers together. Which means that by definition, all of these kind of prides of white lions and tigers in zoos are inbred. And you can see this, this guy here is a very extreme example. He was actually, he was moved to a sanctuary in the end. So he, he was at least able to live out his life in some kind of dignity. But what happens with um, these animals when you breed them together is that like any kind of recessive genetic aberration, it has other things attached to it. So things like cranial deformity, which you can see here, um, respiratory diseases. Um, all sorts of other issues, which uh, and skeletal deformity more generally as well. So these animals are in, not only inbred, they're ill, and they die far younger than they should do. So the idea of breeding with disregard for health, again, is something which happens in zoos all around the world. And the reason that the zoos do it is simply because the visitors think the white tigers are really pretty. That's it. That's literally the only reason they do it. They have no conservation value. So when the, when the zoos talk about these kind of valuable animals and we're breeding them to save the species, it is literally because visitors like to see pretty white lions and tigers. <coughs> so with SeaWorld, the criticism was that animals were taken from their natural homes. And this is something which um, I think most people now believe that with zoos, they do breed their animals on site. They don't take them from the wild, but which is generally true for the, the kind of wider zoo industry. So when we're talking about mammals, um, it's generally true with some exceptions. Um, there have been attempts to import elephants and beluga whales from the wild into zoos in the US in recent years. Um, there's talk actually that there's a couple of elephants potentially being brought over from um, Asia to a zoo in the UK. So it does still happen where the animals are captured from the wild in order to be put in these places. But what a lot of people don't know is that aquariums, because saltwater fish, ocean fish, simply don't breed well in captivity. They don't survive. So by default, if zoos want to show them, they have to take them from the wild. So 80%, at least 80% of um, animals in UK aquariums were wild caught. And that includes all the tropical fish that, that the aquariums are known for and ironically, um, so Finding Dory, this, this kind of breaks my heart. So Finding Dory, apparently, they changed the ending of Finding Dory. Has anyone seen Finding Dory? No, it's brilliant. See it if you haven't. It's dead good fun. Um, so they changed the ending of Finding Dory because they, I think they initially had some kind of link to SeaWorld in it. I was reading an article the other day, and they cut it out. And they were just like, no, we don't want anything to do with this. Um, and obviously, like, just like Finding Nemo before, the whole point of Finding Dory is that she wants to get out of an aquarium. That's, that's, that's sorry, I've just ruined the ending for you, but, you know, she's trying to get out of an aquarium. That's what she's doing. The entire film is about that. And then, bizarrely, Sea Life teams up with um, Pixar. Was it a Pixar film? Um, and do this kind of, like, joint promotion about, about Dory. So now they have this Dory display to go with their Nemo display that they've had for years. Um, which, and it's a story about these animals trying to escape. And again, ironically, because you cannot breed blue tangs in captivity, so Dory's a blue tang, then the Dory fish they have in the aquarium have literally been taken from the sea to be put in the aquarium 
to promote a story about a fish trying to get out of an aquarium. So go figure, I don't know. A little regard for worker safety. Now, the, with SeaWorld, that was obvious. There were numerous deaths, actually. So there were trainers. There were trainers previously before, from when Tilikum was in a place prior to SeaWorld. Um, there was a visitor to SeaWorld who was killed, um, allegedly by Tilikum. He was just found um, floating in Tilikum's pool um, in the morning when workers came in. There was um, his trainer. There was another trainer in Spain. Um, in one of the, the Spanish islands, who was killed. So SeaWorld, obviously, little regard for worker safety. And they kept on putting people back into the water. It didn't seem to matter how many people died. It was only when there was a public uproar about it that they were like, actually, yeah, no, maybe we shouldn't be putting people in a swimming pool with angry orcas. Um, but it happens all over the place. So just that this is a really small list. This list, I think we, I put it together in... It was from a time period of... Uh, probably about 12 months. So a worker shot by a tranquilizer gun in a Spanish zoo in 2014. He was fine, he survived. A young UK zoo worker was tragically killed by a tiger in 2013. That was the same zoo with the 400 animals who died. They did actually bring some kind of charges for that, criminal charges. Um, so yeah, that zoo's still open. 400 animals died. A young zoo worker got killed by a tiger and it was apparently because of a malfunction in the uh, caging sort of system and the zoo's still open. A wolf, this was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. A wolf attacked a toddler in Belgrade Zoo in late 2014. Now the zoo staff here were literally walking a wolf round on a lead in the public area. And there was a video of it and this, you know, this, this little child, thankfully the child was okay. And the wolf I think was also okay. I don't think they did anything to the wolf, but accident waiting to happen, of course. Um, and this one, this one was really, this one got an awful lot of publicity. The young boy who was killed by wild dogs in a US zoo in 2012. Um, and his parents had been hanging him over the, the edge. And they had to watch as their son was, was mauled to death. Um, how is that even possible? How is it even possible to drop a toddler into a wild dog enclosure? A man was killed by a tiger in an Indian zoo in late 2014. And it's thought that he was actually um, trying to take his own life. That he, he went in there deliberately. Um, a young boy had, had to have his arm amputated after being attacked by a tiger in a Brazilian zoo. And this, again, was just the most, the most mind-blowing story. His father had lifted the child. He was, um, how old is he? I think he was about 10. He'd lifted the child over the barriers, given the boy some food to hand out to the tiger. And the tiger pretty much ripped his arm off. And that's a, whole, that's a whole other presentation I have about how we're, we're humanising animals and, and forgetting that they are actually wild and that you can't do that. So yeah, the idea of having little regard for worker safety, um, again, crosses over so much of the zoo industry. I should probably say, so I don't get legal action taken against me. Um, zoos, zoos don't often deliberately flout, try and put their workers in danger in the same way that SeaWorld has been shown to. But the combination of dangerous wild animals angry, dangerous wild animals, frustrated, dangerous wild animals, da dangerous wild animals with serious mental health issues because they have been locked up for their whole life, combined with people, and particularly young people whose um, actions are unpredictable, is just asking for trouble. Um, can I run this without? Hang on, let's see. Are you going to pay for me? Yeah. So... Drugging animals with antidepressants, again, this, this was like a massive thing. When this came out that the orcas were being drugged, everyone was like, oh my goodness, these orcas, there. But this happens everywhere. These animals in zoos are depressed. You know, you imagine that you've limited their space to these tiny, barren enclosures. You're controlling absolutely every aspect of their life. You, they don't get to choose their friends. They don't get to choose their mates. They don't get to choose when to eat. They don't get to choose where they, you know, where they sleep. They don't get to choose any of those things. Um, and so you end up with things like this. So this is just her again. So this is a fairly elderly elephant who was actually, if I remember rightly, I think it was her who was then moved to another zoo in a breeding program across into mainland Europe. This was Chester Zoo in the UK. So she was separated from her tiny little herd, which she'd been with for numerous years. And she then got moved somewhere else because they needed her as breeding fodder. Is it any wonder these animals are depressed? And what she's doing there, this, this shaking of her head was constant, and it's known as a stereotypic behaviour, which is um, 
It's recognised in people, um, for example, some people with autism, um, when, when you're just not coping with external influences and what's going on, then you might sway. Um, in the case of elephants, it's generally swaying with bears. They tend to, they'll sit on their back legs and they'll just kind of jump backwards and forwards. They might bite the bars of their cage. With monkeys, I worked with rescue monkeys for a number of years and some of their uh, stereotypic behaviours are really disturbing. They self-mutilate, so they will literally chew off their own fingers. Other, other animals do that as well. Chew off their own fingers, bite their own tail. Head twist, which is one of the, again, one of the most disturbing things you'll ever see an animal do. Just pacing, twist, violently twisting their head and their whole body and then coming back again. And if you go to a zoo and you spend more than the general sort of 30 seconds that most people send, spend in front of a zoo enclosure, guaranteed you will see that. We will see that in every single zoo you go to. Um, so yeah, the, so it's, it's hardly surprising that these animals are then put on antidepressants. And you, you wonder whether, whether they're put on antidepressants because the zoo actually wants to fix the problem or because actually the zoo just wants them to stop with those behaviours that really don't look good for the industry. Because seriously, if they cared about them and they were interested in the cause of it, you go to the root cause, the root cause is that they're in the zoo. So giving them antidepressants, well, great but it's really not going to do make a huge amount of difference. Um, so yeah, and there are lots of other examples. There's literally, there are literally companies who specialise in anti-anxiety and antidepressant um, medications for captive animals. It's a whole kind of strand of the veterinary um, profession, if you like. And then finally, the one that really made me laugh, it's like, surprise, they're a business. Um, so profiting from animal captivity, that's what they do. <laughs> um, zoos all over the world profit from holding animals captive. That's why they do what they do. And the zoo community is, is a multi-billion pound, dollar, euro, whichever currency you're, you're working in your head. Um, yet they, they tend to kind of present themselves as these sort of not-for-profit, kind of um, benign, Everything you know, everything we do goes back to the animals, kind of thing. Some of them, some of them are not for profit in a legal sense. Some of them are charities, but the zoo industry would generally have you believe that that is what the whole industry is. Um, so, to give you an example from my country, um, only a third of zoos are registered not profits. The rest of them are just businesses like any other. So, no, no interest in really caring for the animals. If they did, they wouldn't have them there. So that brings us, and I've done it in time, I've got loads of time actually. Um, so that brings me to the end um, of this. So I really do believe that seven reasons to boycott SeaWorld are certainly seven reasons to boycott the entire zoo industry. And as we all know, there is literally nothing more annoying than one activist saying to another activist like, hey, you should be working on something different. Um, hate it when people do that. So I'm not saying, I don't think everything, everything I've heard and everything that everyone's doing is incredible. Um, but if you work with an organization that does do multiple campaigns, if you work with an organization that isn't focused on really one specific thing and that's your area of expertise and you've got space, then I would just really love to see um, the AR community kind of stepping up a little bit more and putting themselves out there about zoos and really starting to challenge it. Um, because I think the backlash against SeaWorld is absolutely right. But the backlash against SeaWorld should and could be so much bigger if we start to look at it as a wider industry issue rather than just this one bad apple. Um, and yeah, and finally, shameless plug. If you do, one of the things that everybody always asks, generally not AR activists, but um, sort of members of the public. So what, what is the alternative to, you know, what, where do I take my child if I don't take them to the zoo? And I think we should be ready to answer those questions. Um, and I think those of you who were here just before, Johnny was talking, um, who runs Indra Loka Sanctuary. We've had loads of discussion with uh, loads of great people doing sanctuary work and saying actually visiting a sanctuary is not just a wonderful, fun thing to do. Um, it's also a really amazing form of advocacy. So if you want your young people, or just yourself, to actually spend time with animals who want to spend time with you, because I guarantee you the animals in the zoo certainly don't, then visit one of the sanctuaries, who, which, um, which do open to visitors, go and spend some time there, um, where you and the animals get something out of it. Which is my shameless plug also for a great sanctuary in Spain called Wings of Heart. Um, if anybody hasn't heard of them, check us out on Facebook. I'm doing some work for them guys, and they will soon be moving to a new site where you can also go and visit. So. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions.
Hi, uh, there is a question that I think uh, one is bound to get in discussions like that, and that is the question how actually to safeguard wild animals if there are no zoos. And personally, I think best would be if there's only sanctuaries or even better just animals in the wild, but obviously that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And the question is what can be done to at the same time close the zoos but still have those animal species still remain on the earth because yeah. obviously their natural habitat is being destroyed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that is one of the that's one of the kind of core questions I think that I've certainly been asked a lot of times. I'm sure anyone else working on the issue has. Um, first of all, I would like to say my answer to this really is to, to separate the two concepts. Because zoos breeding animals in zoos for a lifetime in captivity where they are never going to be released. I mean, if you look, if you try and find release programs of endangered animals run by zoos, you're going to find probably about three species because they've been using the same three species as their examples since, since decades, decades and decades. So they'll talk about the golden lion tamarind. They'll say that the species was saved because of zoo release programs. In fact, the species was saved, if you look further into it, the, the golden lion tamarind, yeah, there were 24 individuals released who were captive bred from zoos. Actually, what happened was the local, the local community in the area in Brazil where they were being released ran this incredible education program. There was a huge amount of buy-in from the local community, including um, stopping hunting, et cetera, et cetera, so work on the ground. It's actually never been known how many of those 24 that were released survived, and it was, it's thought to be much more about what was going on on the ground. Um, so for me, the argument that zoos are serving that purpose of safeguarding animals is the, is the first thing that I think we need to dismantle. Whatever, whatever zoos do or don't do, they certainly aren't impacting on helping to save um, sort of species in the wild. So I think the question would be more, let, if we take zoos out of the equation, yeah, how do we protect animals in the wild from hunting, from poaching, but zoos are not the, the industry or whatever that are actually fixing that problem? Does that make sense? in the wild, then at least people might say, and it's not my opinion, but they might say yeah. that those animals then at least they live on in captivity, which yeah. is a bad life as we know. But then it could be like a choice between having no lions or having lions in captivity. I suppose, I suppose then my, my question to the people that ask that is what, va what value are those lions to either you or to the lions themselves? If they're, I guess it's, the same, it's exactly the same argument, isn't it? Like, oh, but if the world went vegan, then the world would be completely overrun with cows. And then what are we going to do? Like, so the idea that as vegans and as talking about ending the agriculture industry, for example, we would advocate, okay, yeah, we, we stop breeding these animals. And what does that mean? Does that mean that we're not going to see cows and pigs and chickens anymore? I would prefer that an animal who's never born can never suffer. And that is, it's a concept which is really difficult for members of the public who've been told for such a long time that, you know, that rhino is alive because that zoo in that city over there exists. And I think it's an ongoing discussion. And I think it's sort of... People need to have patience, both the advocates and also the people listening, because it's not a simple concept. Um, there is, I've, I've actually written something on that exact issue about how, how zoos are, are not actually connected with conservation, um, conservation issues. And there's a book, there's a handbook, the Practical Handbook of Animal Ethics, I think it's called. It's being published later in the year. Um, and if anybody sees it on their radar, then there is a chapter which I've written in that, which is, talks to that exact issue. But it's a complex one, yeah, definitely. That reminded me of a meme where it says, zoos put the con in conservation. <laughs> but um, thank you for everything you do, and I agree with um, you know, definitely having to keep this also on our minds, mm. SeaWorld and the zoos. And I have to thank SeaWorld, because blackfish was kind of the thing that made me realize I wanted to be an animal rights activist. And then it was vegans who were in my face who are just like, all right, awesome, that's so great that you care for these animals, and why Follow are me. you still... <laughs> well, no, 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 they were like, why are you still eating the other animals? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I was in denial, and I was just like, because yeah. I can. I can care for animals and still eat them. Yeah. I mm -hmm. boycott SeaWorld. And um, a lot of people say that, you know, the aggressive, blunt <coughs> vegans who put it in your face, they're not effective. It worked for me, mm -hmm. because they those, those vegans who, like I now, I get so frustrated with people who hate SeaWorld, but 
you know, eat animals. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They were so frustrated with me and my passion for, for anti-sea world, but then I was still trying to defend what I was eating. And um, it was those vegans who were like, dude, you're a massive hypocrite. And <laughs> that was what planted the seed. And so it kind of frustrates me. Like, I'm all for positive interactions when it comes to the cube of truth and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was those online activists who were aggressive with me saying, you're a hypocrite for what you're saying, but what you're doing. And also what I wanted to um, say, I know circuses are completely a separate issue. But um, what I've been trying to educate people as well is the public thinks that the Ringling Brothers closing down was such a success mm -hmm. and that all these animals are going to be retired and look at how good it is. And then, um, you know, I, I will plant little seeds and I will post things on the Internet. And I'm just like, all those elephants are going towards um, cancer medication research yeah. facilities or breeding facilities mm -hmm. in Florida. And um, a lot of people... Which is like, oh, you're just a crazy vegan making things up. And then slowly they'll start <laughs> looking into it themselves. Oh, yeah. And they'll be like, oh, you're absolutely right. Holy shit, she's not just yeah. a crazy vegan. They are using them for cancer research medications. They're not retiring mm -hmm. them. And they're using them for breeding purposes. And all the other animals that aren't in the circuses anymore, they're being <coughs> sold to zoos for breeding purposes. Yeah, and they're being absolutely. sold. And so um, I, I know that that is separate from zoos and um, it, SeaWorld. I think it is and it isn't. I think it's one of the things that, I'm, that interests me is that most... I said most organisations that I know of that work on multiple different campaigns, so not single issue organisations, um, will have somewhere, whether it's on their website, whether it's an active campaign, something about circuses. And actually, aside from the fact they travel around, and I guess, you know, some of the training is perhaps, you know, more, more brutal in circuses than in zoos, but in principle, I, I, I kind of see them as, um, they're quite, for me, they're quite close together on the spectrum. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right. No, 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 absolutely. I'm, I'm really happy for zoos to be... If I can bring zoos closer to how people, people feel about circuses, that's amazing. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think one of the things... And it's, it's, I think it's particularly the case with wild animals because there is no form of captivity or retirement, whether it's a horrific retirement like that or whether it's benign retirement in one of the amazing wild animal sanctuaries doing great work. As soon as you've got a wild animal born into captivity that animal is never, ever going to live the life he or she is supposed to. And I think that's slightly different with domesticated animals. So if you have, you know, if you bring a sheep or a goat or a pig into a sanctuary, they can genuinely live this great life. And, you know, having worked with ex-pet monkeys, but they could equally have been ex-zoo monkeys or ex-circus monkey. well, one ex-circus monkey, actually, um, they're never okay. They have a better life. But as soon as you've got that animal born into captivity, there's there's nowhere for that animal to go. They're not going to be released to the wild. So things like that, like that, what happens afterwards, is also a really important conversation to have. So thank you for raising that. Hey, yes. um, I have a worry, or maybe even a premonition, I hope not, but um, that zoos may be rebranded as uh -huh. sanctuaries uh -huh. in the future. Um, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, it's something that has, has been a huge concern for those of us working in kind of the captivity um, area, if you like. One of the things, yeah, absolutely we're seeing it. So we're seeing zoo rescues animals retired from circus. So suddenly they've become these rescue centres. Again, so you've got a zoo rescuing animals from a circus. Like, what is that about? Um, and in preparation for that, okay, so there's a couple of things actually. There is, um, for example, in... Spain, I think there's work being done, and in other countries actually, to try and introduce a law which both defines a sanctuary and separates them from zoos. So that sort of a legal definition which works, which would generally be no breeding, offer a home for life um, as, the, as the kind of core baseline, which meant that no zoo could possibly pretend to be a sanctuary. Um, that may or may not happen. Legislation, as you probably know, anyone who's involved in lobbying is incredibly difficult. So one of the things that's been done partly in response to exactly that trend of zoos trying to claim to be sanctuaries or X, Y, and Z is the establishment of an organisation called GFAS, so the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. Um, it operates that through Europe and it operates through the States at the moment. I'm not sure where else they're working. But what they've done is they've set up, and it's pretty tough criteria, um, as one of my colleagues at Born Free kind of heads up the Europe side of it, um, it's pretty tough criteria, and they accredit, so they accredit sanctuaries, but they only accredit true sanctuaries, so there's not a chance that a zoo could ever become a GFAS accredited sanctuary. So um, 
it's not legally binding. And one of the problems is you can't re you can't stop zoos from spouting what they spout. You know, that's why they're so popular. People have bought the conservation thing. They've bought the protecting animals thing. But um, so I would say if anyone's interested, then looking up GFAS, if you've got, if you know of a sanctuary, whether that's wild animal sanctuary or a domesticated animal sanctuary, um, check GFAS out because the more things like that are pushed up and have visibility, then the less easy it is for zoos to make those claims. But I think you're absolutely right. It's something which we've been concerned about for a long time and don't haven't got a, a, a sort of silver bullet to, to sort of tackle it. So if anyone else in the room has got any ideas as well, that would be really interesting to hear. Or one more question? Yeah. Um, thanks, Liz, for um, covering this um, <laughs> topic which no one wants to discuss about amongst vegans. <laughs> yeah. A vegan friend of mine in London, I think I told you earlier, um, Ketan, he's actually working on um, a virtual Jew yeah. project which might address some of the issues mm -hmm. in future. It's basically um, it's a, like um, open source project where um, uh, the live footage of animals from all over the um, world is mm -hmm. kept. And if anyone is really wants to see, wants to curious about animals, they just can visit that mm -hmm. um, website and just see the animals um, living in their um, habitat freely and um, without dis getting disturbed. And this is a, like live footage. And children, they don't have to be taken to a zoo to like to yeah. see live yeah. animals in front of them, and which are like being. Um, um, uh, 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 what they call captain captivity. So yeah, mm -hmm. probably this. I mean, I, I would let you know uh, the exact uh, um, status, current status of the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's really. I think there's there's quite a few people are thinking in like really innovative ways. Like, how do you? Because no matter what anyone says, like I say, that yeah, go to a farm sanctuary, go and visit, go and visit a pig or a sheep. People still want to see wild animals, and so that's not going to work. That might work for a room full of activists, but it's not going to work for. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I, I work with kids, and I can't really say this to their parents necessarily. I have to tiptoe around it. But when they are learning about dinosaurs and things like that, and when we're mm -hmm. teaching them about animals that no longer exist, mm -hmm. um, I try to plant little seeds. I'm just like, yeah, do you guys see dinosaurs in the zoos or the aquarium? And they're always like, no, I've never seen one. And I was like, but how much do you know about them? Uh -huh. And and I mean, online and in person, when I'm talking to people outside of my employment, I can be much more blunt. Mm -hmm. But when people are like, oh, but my kid's never going to see a panda. I was like, did your kid see a freaking T-Rex? But he can yeah. tell me everything about it a T-Rex. It explains to me a child's fascination with outer space. Like, yeah. how much money have you got if you send your child to space? Exactly. No. And I'm just like, your child can tell me more about a dinosaur than they can about that panda. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think you're right. And that's what I was going to say. You know, this, this idea of like having an immersive experience. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. An immersive experience where, you know, you, you see a depressed animal leopard just pacing backwards and forwards, like, what are you teaching your child? Like, this is what animal leopards do. They live in these, these weird glass boxes in Scotland, and all they do is pace up and down all day. You watch a documentary, and you see them in their natural habitat with their families doing their thing. You know, they're, they're, there's a reason people are obsessed with, you know, so many friends of mine who are not animal people, obsessed with, you know, the David Attenborough series and those beautifully filmed documentaries because you're, really, you're, you're immersed in their world in a way that a zoo could never possibly offer you. Zoos are just kind of displaying often very sick, unhappy animals. Like, why would you want, why would you want to take your child to that? Uh, I just wanted to add the comment. Um, I use uh, another fact when I talk to my friends about zoos. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just what you said, that you know, the uh, it's not a natural habitat for these animals, mm -hmm. so they don't uh, behave normally. Mm -hmm. But I also say, but do you know that not long ago there were human zoos? Like yeah. even in Warsaw, we had uh, a zoo with mm -hmm. people brought from a yeah. different part of the world. And I said, how, do you, how natural do you think these people were behaving? Imagine yourself close in a cage and then mm -hmm. there would be other people walking around or other species walking mm -hmm. around looking uh, how you are living because they want to, uh, to meet you. And yeah. everyone is shocked because most of the people don't know ago. about uh, uh, human zoos. Uh -huh. Yeah, like Thank the, you. the early 1900s, there was still... You know, they were well. They were taking animals from the wild, and they were taking people from their their natural home and putting them in London Zoo, which just is mind blowing. It wasn't that long ago. It really wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Liz. Thank She'll be you. around for the rest of the conference. If you have more comments, questions.